We come to our last and our most distinguished speaker, uh, a man who is certainly qualified probably as no other person is to give us the, an accurate idea of what space visitors, if and when, will look like. What you've seen, after all, is uh, the testimony of people. We have no evidence that these creatures actually existed in anything else, else than the imaginations of the people who reported them. We have the tales of the people who have messages from big brotherly visitors. We have no evidence, and for lack of evidence, we can simply try to apply our minds to what, if and when, I repeat, space visitors come, they will look like. And we are very fortunate tonight to have the man, as I say, who can tell us more authoritatively what space visitors will look like than probably anybody else. You know I'm speaking of Mr. Willie Lay. Mr. Lay is, has been interested in space travel uh, for a good many years, despite his youthful appearance. In fact, his first book uh, was entitled Trip Into Space, and that book was written, published 29 years ago. That is the extent of Mr. Lay's history of interest in uh, space travel. He has written many other books since then, uh, not only on space travel, but also on one of his specialties, which is uh, biology, zoology. Some of those books, for instance, uh, you probably know about. They have delightful titles. There's The, the Longfish, The Dodo, and The Unicorn. Uh, Salamanders and Other Wonders. Incidentally, both of those books have the subtitle, uh, An Excursion into Romantic Zoology. And uh, I would be inclined to make a private guess to myself that this is a term which might describe Mr. Lay's conception of reports of space visits as of the present time. Romantic Zoology. I don't know. Without any further word, then, I'll turn the platform over to Mr. Lay, and he will tell you what will certainly be the most solid and worthwhile information of the evening. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm carrying here are not notes for a speech, but the invitation which you have all seen, uh, giving me the timing. That's not a new invitation, and it says for me 9.50 to 10, 15, 25 minutes. According to this, we are running five minutes late. However, the CAA regulations state that the pilot does not have to report deviations from the flight plan if they are less than 10 minutes. So, so I think I might just as well go ahead. Whether I will speak for 25 minutes or not is something I simply do not know. Now let me first state, so to speak, a statement of qualifications. Secondly, a statement of attitude, and then I go into the theme proper. Sta statement of qualifications is that I have read most of the books written on flying saucers, if in some cases being annoyed by obvious nonsense, I may have skipped a few pages. Statement of attitude is that I do not say people are liars because they have seen something in the sky that cannot be explained, but that I believe this term is used here in the non-religious sense, that I think that UFOs Provided they exist at all, exist only inside the atmosphere and are natural phenomena. My reason for stressing this inside the atmosphere is something which is not as well known as it could be, and that is that for quite some time, intensive searches were made of space in the vicinity of Earth. One of the reasons for these intense searches were the forthcoming artificial satellites. 
It was known to the people involved that artificial satellites would happen sooner or later. It was believed at the time that artificial satellites would broadcast in the literal sense their presence by means of transmitters, but it was also thought correctly so that these transmitters would be battery powered and the batteries would go out and then all you had left was visual tracking with optical instruments and tracking with short waves by radar and in order to do that effectively you had to make very sure that there were no natural bodies in space which you might misunderstand for artificial satellites. And for this reason, a very thorough search was instituted for the space between the Earth and our natural moon. And in this search, absolutely nothing turned up. No natural satellites, no clandestine artificial satellites, and no spaceships coming from elsewhere or going to elsewhere. Of course, it is always possible to make the hypothesis that with an advanced technology, these things are both invisible and indetectable by radar, but I like, personally, I like one hypothesis at a time. So, having stated my personal convictions, I'll go to the theme for which I was really asked to speak. I must say I brought this all on by myself. I was invited for lunch by the editors of this week. Now I should just have let them buy me a few cocktails and the lunch, and I should have kept my mouth shut. No, what did I do? I answered questions. And the result of answering what I suspected to be well-meaning questions, I wrote an article. But this article had a forerunner, which I did not write myself. Uh, Lester Del Rey spoke here first essentially as a science fiction author. And the past origin of this article I wrote was for science fictional purposes. I have been in the habit all my life to look at the history of everything that comes my way. As a matter of fact, as I said recently somewhere else, at Wasser, if you have to know, uh, I'm a member of the History of Science Society, and of course our pride and glory there always is to know earlier sources than the men who are speaking. <laughs> and so, all my life I've been in the habit of looking for earlier sources. So I, when I began reading American science fiction, I tried to find older science fiction. And I'd like to give you a very quick rundown because this is pertinent to the story. Science fiction does go back to 160 AD. That's the first science fiction story known. Uh, the next one came 1,600 years later. In both cases, nobody visits us, but people from Earth, by technically absolutely inadequate means, go to the moon. Because I can't even blame the others for having used technically inadequate means. Calculus hadn't been invented at the moment. The first story which I have been able to find in which people from elsewhere come to Earth is a German novel that was written in 1893. So some 20 years ago, I was sitting with Sprague de Camp, another well-known science fiction author, in his apartment here in New York, and I was mentioning this, mentioning this novel to him. He didn't know it because it had never been translated into English. And he said, well, how do these visitors look? Well, I said, in this particular case, they are so human that they even can crossbreed. 
And then we started thinking of then recent science fiction stories and how the extraterrestrials had looked. And the extraterrestrials had been all kinds of impossible mixtures, you know, centipedes with 20 pair of wings, aerodynamically completely impossible. Something like lobsters with a few appendages, not precisely propellers, no, the artists didn't go that far, but also something that zoologically made no sense. And so we, the two of us, break and decamp, and I then sat down and said, now what would an extraterrestrial actually look like from the scientific point of view? Let's assume that there are some. What would they look like? We quickly discovered that we ca could not pin down extraterrestrial life as a whole. You do have these enormous dis differences on Earth between the centipede and the jellyfish, the bird and uh, a movie star. But what we could put pin down, or thought we could pin down, was the question of how would intelligent life look. Now, a few things were quite obvious in the first place. Intelligent life shows its intelligence by building things, by making things, and it grows more intelligent in the process. And finally, it comes across methods. Therefore, if it has to use methods in the end, it cannot be an underwater civilization. You might theoretically have an underwater civilization of the cultural and technological equivalent of the Neanderthal men, but you cannot even go to the Cro-Magnon because he already needed metals. Metals must be smelted and that cannot be done underwater. I don't want to bore you with every detail which we reasoned out. It took us two days of debate. I'd just like to say something that, or to repeat something that Lester Del Rey said about the books of the contactees, were they called, namely that eight years after this article was written and published, it was written by Sprague de Camp, but we discussed it together, eight years after it was written and published, I found out that a Dutch scientist had done the same thing 200 years before us. His name is well known in the history of science. Uh, I'm going to pronounce it the way he did. I wish to point out that I do not have a respiratory infection. Some Dutch names just sound that way. His name is Christian Huygens. Christian Huygens, in about 1700, pointed out that the inhabitants of other planets must have eyes to see with. We can pin this down a little more. Last night, I was driven home by an Air Force colonel who expressed his surprise that our eyes utilized only such a small part of all the possible ways. Well, the reason why our eyes do is a very simple one. Our eyes utilize that part of the spectrum to which our atmosphere is transparent. Our eyes cannot see X-rays. I'm simplifying this, of course, in the course of long evolution it has come about that. But our eyes do not see X-rays because X-rays which started 200 miles away wouldn't get to them. So our eyes work on those rays to which our atmosphere happens to be transparent. That's what we can add to reference. Heavens have said furthermore that the intelligent beings must have organs like hands or other of the function of hands to manipulate things. 
we can add to that 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 leaves out a tentacle-like tentacle organ like the elephant's tongue, which is very strong in pulling, but is not, for lack of internal bracing, strong in pushing. Obviously, an intelligent being must be able to move around. Therefore, it has to have legs of some kind. Uh, one of the things that old persons 200 years ago did not mention, but which surprised both Brick, the camp, and me when we thought about it and discussed it, is the fact that of all creatures with an internal skeleton on Earth, you never had more than four limbs. It just doesn't exist. What we do not know, what we cannot tell, is whether this is a sheer accident of terrestrial evolution or whether there is a natural law that we simply do not happen to know. At any event, I want to pull this together, uh, we came to the result that an intelligent being of another planet cannot be much smaller than a human being because then there would be not enough body cells to support the brain cells and there must be so and so many brain cells because we have postulated that it is intelligent. Uh, now can it be much larger than something else comes in which is known as the square cube law and which makes it very clumsy. In short, we ended up with a creature which, as I phrased it later, if somebody who needs glasses but doesn't wear any, in dusk, seen from a distance, would not at once be able to tell from a human. This, of course, does not mean minor accidents of evolution. A minor accident of evolution is whether my ears are large and floppy or whether there aren't any external ears. A minor accident of evolution is whether I have hair all over or none at all. Uh, even smaller accident, of course, is a different skin coloring. A very small accident would be the procession or absence of a tail. So as soon as somebody tells me he had contact with people looking just like us, I already have all the biological reasons in the world for not believing it. How large the differences might be is something we can't tell, but the living body has to fulfill certain functions and there must be a general resemblance. In conclusion, I'd like to say one more thing. In all this reasoning, uh, one main assumption has been made without being mentioned. Namely, that the chemical constitution of the non-terrestrial life is similar, or more precisely, the same, very much the same as ours. Are we justified in making such an assumption? In some cases, ignorance is a justification. We are talking here somewhat from ignorance. Our bodies are built on the carbon atom. The carbon atom has three characteristics which are quite unique. One is it combines readily with almost anything, argon, neon, krypton, and so on being obvious exceptions. Uh, however, it does not favor anything unduly any other atom for combination. And the third characteristic is that carbon likes to hook into itself and form enormous chains, thereby producing molecules of the size and complexity necessary for what we call life. And it has been said, oh, in about 1900, that there might be a life form in which the silicon atom replaces the carbon atom. This, of course, would lead to very interesting creatures. 
But in the first place, silicon is not as versatile. In the second place, silicon favors oxygen in a very pronounced manner. In other words, if you have any silicon hydrogen compound, a single molecule of excellent oxygen coming, wafting along, will break this up. So you do not get the complexity of the compounds to fulfill the life processes. In other words, we are pretty sure now that although silicon is quite similar to, ox uh, to, to carbon, it is not similar enough to be a substitute. And if silicon life exists anywhere in the universe, it would be on a planet where there is no free oxygen around. And it probably would be about as intelligent and as mobile as uh, average, not too tight oyster. I make, being broad minded, although I was cautioned in the beginning not to be, being broad minded, I make one possible exception. So far, I have spoken about life at temperatures which we would find either comfortable or at least bearable, not killing. It has been suggested that at very low temperatures, those temperatures which on Earth happen when somebody makes liquid oxygen, that there is another life chemistry possible. Well, we do not know enough chemistry to say that it is possible. Since we do not know enough chemistry, we also cannot say it is impossible, so I have to leave this open. Now, to sum up, I believe, A, that life exists elsewhere in the universe. On the other hand, I do not believe that the so-called UFOs can even exist outside of our atmosphere, I think they are natural phenomena, but if we ever get a visit from space, I believe that the life forms, the intelligent life forms that built this ship will be built along the lines of our chemistry and will obey the mechanical laws which have come into play in building the bodies of Earth creatures. Thank you.